So this uh, series called Bystander is one that we started here at ABC two or three weeks ago. And uh, when we were talking today about what we would uh, do in this live stream, we wondered about whether this was the right theme for today or whether we should pick on something else. But the more I kind of got into it and the more I got into preparing for today, the more I realized actually I think this is a great theme for today. And I really hope that it will be helpful to you, whether you're exploring faith, whether you're looking for reassurance, whether you've been a Christian for ages, or whether you're just brand new to this whole church thing. So just a quick recap, because I recognize there'll be lots of you who are joining us for the first time and haven't picked up on the rest of the series. So the recap goes like this. Sometimes people think that belief in God is based on blind faith or unfounded hope. But we've been saying throughout this series, that's not the case. And so what I hope and pray from today is that you'll see you don't have to have blind faith or unfounded hope to believe in a God who is here for us and who loves us. Maybe today you just need a reason to cling on to God in the midst of all that's going on. Maybe you're not a religious or a church person, but you just want to find some hope. And maybe, honestly, you've just come across this live stream this morning as you were looking for something else uh, on the internet and maybe you're pretty skeptical, really, but you're hanging around to see what we might have to say. Or maybe you're searching for something bigger. Maybe in the midst of all of this, you're wondering, is there something beyond us and our struggles? Through this series, we're being introduced to a man, a bystander, who has this amazing confidence in something bigger than him. This amazing belief in God that sustained him through the darkest of times. This amazing expectation that there is life beyond just himself. And his confidence, his belief, and his expectation weren't built on blind faith or unfounded hope at all. Now, this guy's name was John, and he lived 2,000 years ago, and he was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus. He was a bystander to all that Jesus said and did. I want to introduce you, first of all, before we get into the rest of it, to, to the reason why he wrote down his eyewitness account of Jesus' life. And this is really important because John was passionate. John, in the later years of his life, either came to the conclusion himself or was convinced that it would be a good idea to write down what he had seen. And there was a reason why he did that. Now, throughout the, the talk this morning, I'm going to be throwing some words of John up on the screen here. And if you want to follow along, you can do that just by watching. But also, there's a wonderful app called the YouVersion Bible app that you can download on your phone uh, or on your tablet. And you can follow on with a live YouVersion event that's going on right now. So let's go and look at John chapter 20, verse 31 in the New Testament part uh, of the Bible. Let's have a, a look at that now. And this is an explanation as to why John wrote down his story. He says this, These are written, these things, these events in the life of Jesus, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This was why John wanted to write all this stuff down so that people who were coming after him, even people thousands of years later, could believe that Jesus is the Messiah or the saving one because they could see what John had seen through the words that he had written. They could see that Jesus was the Son of God and that by believing, just like John believed, you could have life in his name. See, John's confidence, belief, and expectation were built on what he had seen and what he wrote down that he had seen. Not blind faith or unfounded hope. And he wanted those who came after him to be able to see too, even in the darkest of times. So John wrote this stuff down. And, and in the beginning part of his book in particular, he writes down seven different events from the life of Jesus. And they're fascinating events and they're amazing things that Jesus went about doing. But each of those events also contains a sign. And a sign is something that points to something. And, and John is not just recording an event. He's saying it's pointing to somebody, something or somebody. He's recording this sign. And then the sign points to the identity. So each of these seven events, event, sign, identity, and that's a repeated pattern in John's account of Jesus' life. And we're in part three today. We're looking at the third event, the third sign, and we're calling it carry on. 
Now, today, as we alluded to earlier, is Mother's Day, and it's a weird kind of Mother's Day, I know, but I wanted to share with you one of my favorite stories that, that I have from the life of my mum. Very sadly, she passed away some 30 years ago, but it's a story that I still hold on to. It's a memory that I still have. And for like many people, I guess, Mother's Day is not always a happy occasion for me. It's a poignant one. Now, this story goes like this. Uh, about 30 or so years ago, when my mum wasn't very well, she was in hospital. And uh, I was away at university, and uh, I travelled down on a Friday evening to go and visit her uh, and my family for the weekend. And I was travelling with my girlfriend, who has now become my wife, uh, Ruth, and we went down together on this Friday evening. And the plan was that we would go and see my mum during hospital visiting hours on the Saturday. But as we traveled down on the Friday night, I suddenly thought, how cool would it be to surprise her? She knew we were going on the Saturday, but I thought how amazing it would be to surprise her on the Friday evening. So we arrived at the hospital on our way home, and we went into the ward, and we found a wonderful nurse. And we said to her, look, you know, I'm uh, Sue Porter's mum. Is there any chance that I could visit her? And the nurse said, look, I'm really sorry. It's outside of visiting hours. You shouldn't really come in. And clearly she saw the look of disappointment on our faces and she knew my mum so she also knew how amazing the surprise would be for my mum. So she said, I tell you what, I'll bend the rules for you. Come and see your mum. So Ruth and I, we walked down the corridor to the room where my mum was staying and as we approached the room, I saw her sitting on the end of a bed of another patient and they were chatting away. And uh, she was looking at this other lady. And as we approached the room, she obviously caught something out of the corner of her eye. And she turned and she looked at us. And I'll never forget the look on her face, this amazing beaming smile. And she turned to the lady on the bed and she said, that's my son. And she just had this glorious look on her face. And not long after that, she passed away. But that memory, that look, is something that I have cherished for 30 years and can still remember to this day and I still hold on to on many mother's days but I'm also so grateful to that nurse who refused to let the rules get in the way of love and compassion and sometimes in religious circles or in churches or even religious people seem somehow to let religious commandments and traditions get the priority over love and compassion. They allow judgment to triumph over love, rules and rituals to triumph over relationship, tradition to triumph over engaging with people. And maybe you've experienced that and maybe that's put you off God in the past or even put you off church. And this is a time where we're being forced to reevaluate what's really important as a society, but also as churches, to take stock of what really matters. And today's event that John tells us about is really helpful in that reevaluation. In the time of Jesus and John, There were these amazing Jewish religious festivals. There was a cycle of them that was really old, and there were four different Jewish festivals. And even the newest one of those, even Hanukkah, was centuries old. And of these four festivals, there was another one called Sabbath. And that's the one we're going to be looking at today. But this core idea of these festivals had been hijacked Because they were created by God to bring good gifts to his people, to bring joy, hope, rest. That's what they've been created for, not to be legalistic tools for controlling behavior. And this event today begins with Jesus arriving in Jerusalem for one of these festivals. And I want to read now from John chapter 5, from John's account chapter 5, the story of what happened when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem for this festival. So let's look first at verses 1 and 2 of the story. It says this, John says this, Some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. I want you to notice here all the detail, the detail that John gives us about this pool and about the colonnades and about the gate and all that kind of stuff. You'd only know that if you'd been there. You'd only know that in your mind's eye when you're writing this down, if you'd actually been there. And that's why John is able to give us all of this detail. So now we go on to find out what happened in the story. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? 
See, this pool, a whole kind of myth and a legend had grown up around this pool. And it, and it was that when the waters bubbled or stirred, which they did periodically, if you dived down into the pool, if you were the first one to get into the pool, then somehow this angel that was stirring the waters would heal you. And so people who were unwell or unhealthy or who couldn't walk or who were lame or blind, they, they headed to this pool and often they lay there all day, every day waiting for the waters to bubble and to try to be the first one in. And included in this bunch of people was a man who'd been unable to walk for 38 years. And Jesus arrives. And it's interesting that Jesus arrives in this place because this was a place where healthy people didn't go. Because you've got to imagine, you've got people who are sick and unwell, who can't move oftentimes, lying around in the heat of the sun all day, every day. It was a filthy place. It would have been a horrible place. It would have been smelly and dirty. It's not the place where healthy people went. But you see, Jesus is a, place, Jesus is a person who goes where other people won't. So Jesus is there and he says to the man, he obviously sees something in the man, do you want to get well? And the man doesn't answer straight away, really, or doesn't give a straight answer to the question. Look at uh, what he says. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So this man isn't able to get into the pool. He's not able to get in quickly enough to be healed. He doesn't realize that in Jesus there's somebody who can bypass all of that legend and myth and do something extraordinary. Look at what happens next. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. So we've had the event, this meeting by the pool, and now we get the sign. And the sign is that Jesus heals this man. And, and look, I love this language that he uses, get up. Um, John would have written this originally in Greek. And in, in the Greek, this, this phrase could also be translated, wake up or rise up or come to life. I love that. Jesus is bringing life to this man come to life and the healing is immediate man doesn't need to do anything there's no confession of sin or or strange ritual to go through no no he just obeys and immediately he's healed and then Jesus does something really interesting he says pick up your mat and walk now why did he need to do that I don't want us to miss this point this is really important and we'll see why because Jesus has a point to make about his identity. So he says to the man, pick up the mat and walk. And here we find out why. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. So one of these Jewish festivals. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. See, on the Sabbath, there were all these laws governing what you could and couldn't do. Actually, this isn't true. The written law didn't forbid that. It was something called the oral law because these religious leaders, they took the written law that God had given and, and they added all this extra interpretation to it. They created 39 categories of forbidden things for the Sabbath, including carrying something. And I think Jesus knew that and I think Jesus had a point to make. You see, the religious leaders were more interested in the law than they are in the miracle, in the sign. They don't give a stuff about the man. I mean, this man's been healed, his life has been changed, and all they're worried about is the law. The whole point of the Sabbath was to take a break from work, not from love. They were missing the point. And so often it's so easy for us to miss or ignore the why behind the what. And we've done this in church sometimes. And we will do really well in these days to remember the why. In these days where we can't do church like we normally do it, in these days where we can't meet physically, we can still do the why. I mean, meeting physically is great, and I can't wait till all this is over and we get to do it again. We get to inspire and encourage one another and be together and be challenged and, and learn together and all that kind of stuff. But we can still do that. We can still do the why. We can still share and be encouraged. And that's why I'm so pleased that you're joining us today. We will do well to remember the why, not the what right now. Now, this man, he doesn't share their concern about the law, not unreasonably. Let's look what he says. He says, but he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. He says, I don't know about all this religious law stuff. All I know is I've got new life. 
And I've got this joy of new life and it's taking over. I picked up my mat and I walked because a man who healed me told me to. A man who loved me told me to. So I opted for him, not the ones who've been ignoring me my whole life and who don't care about me. And then we go on. So they, the religious leaders, asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. So Jesus had slipped away. The man didn't know who'd helped him. But actually, if we just skip forward a couple of verses, the religious leaders find out, and then they come to Jesus and they accuse him. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, because it was this festival and there was all this oral law and he wasn't supposed to do all this, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. They didn't care about the love he'd shown or the compassion or the amazing miracle he'd performed. They didn't care about any of that. They started to persecute him. And then Jesus defends himself. And look, here's where we move from event to sign to identity. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. As Jesus ident- uh, defends himself, he talks about his identity. He says, I am bigger than the Sabbath because I am the son of God. I am bigger than the Sabbath because I am equal with God. And God is bigger than the Sabbath. It was his idea in the first place. So if I want to do love and compassion and amazing things on the Sabbath, then that's my thing to do. And Jesus makes it very clear who he thinks he is, the Son of God. So two really important things that I want us to take from this event that John documents, this sign and this pointer to Jesus' identity 2,000 years ago. In a world of uncertainty, tension, suffering, disagreement, God made it really simple. He showed up and he spoke up. And he said, I am here. Here is God. And in me there is life. He showed up and he spoke up. And he said, even in the midst of turmoil, I am here and there is life. And secondly, God made it really clear what the heart of following Jesus is to be about. It's to be about loving God and loving people. You see, you can't separate the two things. You can't claim to follow all the religious laws and rituals and turn up to church every Sunday and all that kind of stuff, which we can't do anymore. You can't claim to do all of that and not have a love for people in your heart. And in these days, we need people more than ever who are prepared to express love for God by loving people. If your version of Christianity gets in the way of loving people, then you have the wrong version. And if you've been wounded by Christians who have had the wrong version of Christianity, I'm so sorry, but that's not the Jesus way. And I don't want you to be put off Jesus because of that. Here's the question we should all be asking ourselves in this season. Actually, whether we're Christians or not, we should all be asking ourselves this question. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? Does love require of me that I go out and stockpile all the stuff I need so other people can't have any? Does love require of me that I hunker down in my own home and don't watch out for the needs of my neighbors all around me? What does love require of me? See, the Christian faith is not based on blind faith or unfounded hope. It's not based on Sunday services or doing church a certain way, although church is really important as I think we'll discover in these days, even though we have to do it differently. The Christian faith is way bigger than doing church as we have always done it. The Christian faith is based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we know about it because of bystanders like John who wrote it down. And if John were here today, he'd say, my my faith in Jesus as the Son of God, the saving one, is not based on blind faith or unfounded hope. It's based on what I saw And I wrote it down so you can see it too. See, John would say, I don't have an unfounded hope that the Christian faith is true. Because I know it's true, I have a hope. And it's our prayer that for you in these days, you wouldn't find an unfounded hope that God is somehow real and exists. You would know God exists because of the witness to the life of Jesus of people like John. You would know God exists and in him, you would find hope. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much 
for showing up and speaking up to show us who you are and what you're like. We thank you that 2,000 years ago, in the midst of turmoil and upheaval and suffering, you showed up and you went to the places that nobody else would go and you did the things that other people wouldn't do and you demonstrated your love for humanity. I pray in these days we would feel you showing up as we turn our eyes towards you, as we hear the accounts from the people who were there, who were bystanders, that we would see who Jesus was and who he is. May you give us not an unfounded hope that Jesus is real and that he is your son, but because we know that is to be true, we will find hope. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. It's always great, isn't it, to hear so many inspiring stories about what Jesus has done and what he's doing in people's lives. Um, but we don't just meet on YouTube. We also meet in various ways throughout the week. And one of those ways is on Facebook, um, on Instagram, or with our Facebook group. And if it's your first time with us or if you've been with us a long time, you, I want to encourage you and you're always welcome to join us in our online community. And if you just search Hope Church Oswestry, you will find us. Another way that we meet throughout the week is on, in various ways on Zoom. And one of those ways is through meeting as small groups. And they happen at various evenings throughout the week. And we also have a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and that's at eight o'clock. And everyone is welcome to come and join us at that as well. And if you're interested in connecting um, with our small groups or with our prayer meetings, please email us at hopechurchosestry.org.uk forward slash connect. So thank you to everyone who also supports us financially, whether that's a one-off gift or regular giving. We want to say a big thank you um, for your generosity um, to us. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been raising money um, for local, our local hospital to give them a hamper to say thank you for all the hard work they are doing and they've done and we raised so much money through your generosity that we weren't able to just to give one hamper we were able to give 12 hampers and here's um, a picture of all the hard work Les Sharp has put into buying all the goodies putting them all together making them look beautiful and dropping them off at the hospital If you'd like to support us financially please go to hopechurchoswestry.org.uk forward slash give so here at Hope Church, we want to encourage as many people to get involved in all the things that we do. And here's a message from Kat about something exciting that's coming up. And if you like to make cake or possibly eat cake, then I encourage you to listen really carefully to this next video. are learning all about patience from their Sunday morning videos and the theme for their videos this month is Bake Off and we thought that that was the perfect opportunity to have a bit of a Hope Church Bake Off challenge and we thought well it would be unfair wouldn't it if we just let the kids have all the fun so we are going to be running a kids competition and an adults competition and we would love for as many of you to join in as possible. If you'd like to take part, and we really hope that you do, all you need to do is uh, bake something along the theme of spring. So there's no restrictions on the ingredients you can use. You can bake anything that you like, but it has to fit the theme of spring. When you've finished your bake, uh, take a photograph of it and send it to me. You can send it to me at cat at Hope Church Oswestry. Org uk, um, and if you want to add a bit of a description and tell us a bit about how it was made then you can do that as well and you've got until the 31st of March to do that so until the end of the month and then on the 1st of April I will then upload all the pictures I have been sent in to Facebook we'll have a kids and adults um, zone and you will be able to vote for your favourite bake so they're going to go up anonymously so no one will know who has baked what and then you'll have until Easter Sunday to vote for your favourites. And then on Monday, the 5th of April, we will announce a winner for each round and there will be some prizes. So 
Have lots of fun baking. I really look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thank you for joining us in our service today. If you're watching this live, we have a catch up on Zoom at 12 noon and everybody is welcome to join us at that. And the information for that will be available at the end of our service. But let's just finish our time together with a beautiful song from Jules. Yeah. Mm -hmm.